by Julia Albright. Julia is VP of Solutions, aka Product Management for NextGen Healthcare with nearly 20 years of experience in product management or, and in the healthcare in industry. Prior to working for NextGen, she worked for several industry and thought leaders such as Siemens Healthcare, Varian Medical, and Bra Brain, Brain Lab. She has a PhD in medical physics from the Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany. Please welcome Julia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And uh, thank you for Shalcon for the invitation to speak today. Um, the main topic of, of this presentation is uh, probably something we all have experienced. You guys are all IT security experts. I'm not. I don't sell products uh, in that sense, at least not to you guys. Um, and, and, but we have uh, a vulnerability and, and really you, you come to the business and nobody is doing anything, right? You're being brushed off, that happens all the time. And that's what I wanna talk to you about today. Who would help if this works? Um, who am I? I already got a very nice introduction. Uh, I'm a VP of Solutions and Solutions, aka Product Management, uh, for a medical software company. Uh, we produce a software that helps small practices of independent physicians have an EHR, ele electronic health record, do their practice management, so all the scheduling of patients, and then in the back end, all their billing as well. Uh, our solution is cloud-based, and that's why I get a lot of calls from people saying, hey, we need to do something right now because somebody's trying to get into our system and we need engineering resources to do this. And um, yeah, I need to most of the time say, no, we, we're not going to do anything. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm not an engineer. Uh, I'm definitely not a coder, don't know how that works. Uh, I'm a physicist by training. Uh, and, and so I have technical background. I can mostly talk to you guys, but the, the keynote speaker this morning, way over my head, right? I have no idea what he was talking about. Um, but uh, I have 20 years of experience um, on making decisions on whether to do a project or not. And this is, this is the main um, aim for this presentation. What are we going to talk uh, about? We're going to talk about the difference uh, the dynamic between the, the security teams and, and product management. Uh, I will give you a slight viewpoint of the business side so that we can uh, understand where everybody's coming from. I'll shortly explain what product management is and how we think. And then um, I'm hoping with the talk to get a better understanding from both sides how things work so that we can communicate better and find the best solution for the business. So what is product management? There is a lot of different names that all mean the same thing and then slightly different things, but most of the time it's called either product management or product marketing. Sometimes it's called uh, uh, inside, um, inside uh, marketing, outbound marketing, uh, upstream, downstream, solutions, it's all the same thing. It's looking at any project that needs R&D resources and evaluating whether make, doing that project or not makes business sense for the, for the overall business. Um, so this is, this is what we're, we're charged to do in product management. We're charged to maximize sales and revenue uh, and also to increase profit margin. So that's the sole purpose of product management. We look at it holistically, not only engineering, we look at it from marketing, we look at it from accounting from all different perspectives. And when we do that, uh, we, there are certain components that go into that. Um, there is the profit and loss analysis that our business does. So that's where we look where how much money is coming in, how much money is going out, are we making profit, which deals are we winning, which deals are we losing. Then there is something that we call a product life cycle. That's from the, an idea of a project all the way to execution, rollout, um, and then marketing of the product, but then eventually we need to decide we're going to retire a product. That's another situation where we have communication with the IT security team because oftentimes the IT security team would really like to pull a product out of the market because it's so old, technology is so old, you can't guarantee that it is still safe to be out there. And usually there is a business reason why it stays. Sometimes it's just laziness, but oftentimes there's a good business reason why it stays. 
then planning and forecasting. We're the ones that create roadmaps. And oftentimes, honestly, they're pie in the sky. But more often than not, there's actually a reason why we created a, a product roadmap, why we want to go a certain direction, why we're uh, investing in certain areas of the business, why we are investing in engineering resources in a particular area. And then the area of production, that's most of the time in a software company, that's actually uh, engineering coding. Um, but when I was working for medical device companies, uh, where they actually make hardware, that also includes the actual physical making of, of the product. So we're involved in that as well. And then, as I said, the marketing and launch of, of any product. So we are the ones that provide the input into what is the marketing message that is being provided to the field. Um, how are we differentiate to our competitors? How do we differentiate between our own product lines and, and who is our, our market? And then we monitor the market and uh, the product in the market. When it's out there, how is it performing? What are clients saying? Is it coming to an end? Do we need more innovation? Do we need to change something? Was there another innovation in a different area that will guide us into a new area? So that, that's uh, predominantly what we're doing. And while we are doing that, I already um, said that the whole focus is how to maximize the impact. How do we maximize the benefit of that product for the business? Uh, we are effectively with that, um, with that responsibility, the gatekeepers to R&D. Anybody who wants R&D resources typically has to go to product management and present a case and say, we need to do this. I need resources for this particular project to get done. And most of the time, we say no. Um, we prioritize the different projects. That's how we say no or yes to a project. There is certain categories that I will talk about um, on, on you know, what we're doing in order uh, to qualify a project or, or disqualify a project. And this is done predominantly through a business analysis. And, and we will go through that. It's, it's, it's actually, if you think about it, it's a very simple, simple process. But we get paid the big bucks. So you know, we, we have to go through it. Um, already in my introduction kind of said, why, why am I presenting, right? And um, on a very frequent basis, I have the scenario that's, that's on the board. I'm, I'm getting a random email from somebody who said, hey, looping in Julia, because I don't know, thought she should know. And it's usually an email that has been going on 10, 15, 20 exchanges. And it's some, from my perspective, some random IT security guy screaming at an engineer that there is a vulnerability, saying we have to fix it absolutely right now. And he wants one or two scrum teams. And this needs to be done absolutely right now. Right? Like, absolutely. There is no way. This is a huge vulnerability. And, and, um, and that's, that's all that's in that email. There is no information. Where did it come from? Except the guy that sent it. He's an IT security guy, so he, he, he knows what he's doing. Right? He, he really knows. But other than that, I don't know anything about it. And um, we do agile development. So we have scrum teams that work on two-week increments. And, and they want people to drop everything and, and go on this project. And I say, absolutely not. The Scrum team is continuing what they were assigned to do for this Scrum. Um, we are not, we are not uh, changing anything. So the response you get from me, if you approach me this way, is absolute pushback. And why am I pushing back? Because I don't know anything. I need to make a business decision on whether or not this project is important enough to interrupt our entire development process or not. I don't know which systems are affected. What kind of data is affected? Is it patient data that my clients have been entering into their EHR? And, and because it's patient data, you know, um, that's a huge security risk, right? Is, it, is my database affected? Is, is, you know, is it just, quote unquote, just my application? Is the risk just that we are going to be down for a few hours? Or is the risk that somebody is absorbing the, the data for uh, several million patients? That makes a huge difference um, for me, at least when I make that decision. Then the next question is, have you done any evaluation 
like how long it will take to figure out are we even are we even affected did you just read this in the newspaper and or it was in a chat room and it was the latest vulnerability that got promoted on i don't know some some magazine or some chat room or is this actually something that you know is known out there and and we need to know about it um, and then, of course, like, do you have any idea how long it will take to fix this? Is there, is there any idea as to how many engineers you need, what kind of engineers you need? Um, and then, you know, what's the skill set of the people that you need? Maybe it's the prod ops team and not the engineering team that you need. Maybe it's, it's a different group that all together. Uh, and maybe we don't have the expertise and we need to bring somebody in. So those, those are the questions that I, I will push back with. And I say, until we have answered the majority of these questions, there, no decision will be made and you are not going to get any resources to do anything. The reason I'm pushing back is there is two major tools that product managers or any business person uses. And that's a business case or a business plan. And those terms have been throwing around a lot. Effectively, a business case is for an exact, uh, existing business or product, and a business plan is for anything that's new. Since we're detecting a vulnerability, we're affecting an existing business. And so we need to enter any information in, in our minds, at least. We don't always have to formalize it, but we need to look into uh, a business case and what this business case could potentially look like because this business case will be compared to all the other business cases that we have that we made a decision on to move forward with this specific engineering project. And a business case uh, has uh, very simple components uh, that need to be answered. And I'm not saying the IT department or the IT security department has to do all of this. It's the responsibility of product management. But they will ask the questions necessary to fill in the blanks in this business case in order to, to make a decision. So the first item, of course, is, is a short description. If we can't find the right words to explain in a simple way, I mean, I'm not an IT person. If you tell me I have no idea, uh, Jenkins is down and we need to do X, I'm like, I have no idea what that means. Uh, I Honestly, like, tell me what this means. Does it mean my clients cannot enter anything? Does it mean engineering cannot do their work? You know, tell me exactly what's going on in more or less layman terms. Uh, that's the first item. And because not only because I'm not an engineer or an IT person, it's also the person that I report to. They usually have no clue or even less clue than I have, right? They're, they're probably sales person, people. They're, um, they're C-suite people that um, that will not care whether something you know is broken. They just want to sell stuff and they want to make money. Um, then the next item, after a short description of the problem, I need to know a short description of what the solution could be. Is the solution to rebuild the entire software? Is the solution to shut down certain ba uh, databases? Is the solution to um, I don't know, upgrade to a newer version of TLS. Is it, you, tell me what, what, you're, what you think is in the best solution for this, for this pro uh, problem. And then we have to evaluate the cost of implementation. And I understand that most of the time the IT security team cannot do that. Then we need engineering to come in or whoever the resources are, they need to look at it and they need to say, well, we need a full scrum team for three weeks however long, and, and we put that in there on the cost side. Um, we need to know exactly what kind of people we need because they might not all be on one scrum team. We might, we might need to have to pull people from multiple scrum teams. So those are the things that, that we need to know. And then tell me, if we don't do this, what happens? Right? So if, if we decide not to fix whatever problem we have, what is the potential risk that we are we're engaging in because this is again there's a decision of doing things and we can do multiple things but there's also the risk of not doing things and sometimes the reality is we will not do anything and finally there is a timeline um, so even when you have the resources you know how many hours um, is there something is there an event happening in the future that we need to take into account 
is this a software version that we are going to retire in three months anyway? Does it make sense to put a fix in right now that takes two months to do? It's only in the market for a month. So those are the, the items that, that we need to talk about. The biggest step then that the product management team has to do is to provide a report or, or provide a, a proposal to people who actually have the power and figure out, okay, what is our recommendation? Are we going to do this or are we not going to do this? And if I can only ta say that, I don't know, person X, Sean from IT security told me to fix this, my executive team will shut it down. If I don't have data to support my case, this will not get done. Uh, and that's why I've been pushing back. That's why I've been asking all these questions. So I need to know exactly what's the impact of doing or not doing this. And that's why I've, I've been asking you or your counterparts of like, what, what is it that, that, that we're actually talking about here? Um, what does it take to do it? Is, it? is it a quick thing? Is it something that we can bring in from the outside? Is it even worth doing? Um, those are the, the questions. And then, um, as I said, with the, with the timeliness, how quickly does this need to be done? If there is a known vulnerability out there that everybody knows about, so if I can Google it and figure out, like, somebody has already like, an extensive written write-up about it, and I understand what's written in there, it's probably very known, because by the time I find it, everybody should be able to find it, and we probably need to fix it. So that's, that's the basic concept of how uh, product management uh, thinks and how we, how we work. Uh, we compare uh, all the information that we gather for this particular case with all the information we have about our other items. And in my, in my case, for, for healthcare, uh, we have regulatory requirements that usually trump everything else. If we have, um, most of you guys will be familiar, if you ever have gone to a doctor, we have HIPAA which is a, you know, a huge item, at least in theory, for everybody. You go to any dentist, they're violating their HIPAA regulations, but uh, we all try. We all try to, to be vigilant. When we have a, a HIPAA violation in our software, all, all hands are on deck. Um, if we have a regulation that allows physicians uh, to be paid for the services that they're actually providing, that is, is another item that will trump out almost any other item on the list. And then, of course, we have uh, anything that has to do with, with uptime or slowness of the system. Those kinds of things usually trump everything else as well. Um, and, then, and then we have product improvements, customer requests, all those, those other items. And then, of course, I have sales in my back yelling at me for they have these three potential customers that want this one feature that probably nobody else will ever use, but they really need it in order to close their deal. So those are the other people that are constantly pushing on me, uh, trying to get resources to get this one thing done for their favorite customer. And we have to squeeze whatever you guys are reporting in into that model. And that's kind of why I'm here. I, I really wanted to um, talk to you guys about, you know, how are we thinking, what are we doing. We're not trying to brush you off and say, oh, you guys don't matter, we don't care about you. It's really about, we don't understand what you guys are doing. You guys are experts, you're probably highly paid. Where you, 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 know, you know what you're doing. We need your help to understand what you're telling us so that we can figure out whether we need to do this. I had a, a case earlier this year where somebody like, like the email exchange that, that I referenced was saying, well, we have a vulnerability in our database. Well, we have like 20 databases that we use. That doesn't mean anything to me if you tell me there is a vulnerability in the database. I, mean, I Googled this, of course, and you know some companies that are trusted had already reported on this vulnerability, so it's not a completely unreasonable request. I get this, but tell me more. 
tell me like what's going on with the system and that person couldn't he couldn't tell me whether patient data was affected he couldn't tell me whether accessibility for our clients was affected he, he just didn't have any answers he didn't even know how many of my databases were affected and and i have to push back on those so uh, what I encourage you to do is work with your product management team. Go to them and, and talk to them and say, okay, when we detect a vulnerability, whatever tool we use, um, is there a certain process that you would like to use so that we can talk to you? Um, is, there, is there anything that um, you, know, you need to know before you can make a decision whether or not a vulnerability should be closed or not? Um, when you report something, identify where that information came from. If you did a vulnerability scanning from a credible you know, company, probably most product managers will, will know the handful of companies that are out there. And you say, well, what we're doing is every night we run a certain scan and we pick the top five things and we need to fix them, right? Like you, you probably have plans like that. Um, talk to me about it. Come to me and say, well, Julia, October 1st, we start a new project. For the next three months, we're going to be really on your case because we're, we're doing this new process and there's a lot of new input that's coming in and we need you to have resources available um, so that we can fix what we are finding. We would be neglig negligent if we are not fixing what we're finding. I, I totally get that. And we want to fix whatever we can. When you do the scans, tell me which systems did you scan so that I can, I can understand what part of the business is affected. Is it my backup? Is it my front end? What is it? Is it something that engineering tells me if this fails, we're down for months? Well, that's the problem. I'll fix that right away, right? Like, we cannot, we cannot do that. Our clients, um, you know, depend on us being available 24-7 so that they can treat their patients. So. Uh, we cannot, you know, obviously be down for, for any um, a long amount of time. And then give me the good weather scenario and give me the bad weather scenario. Tell me what happens if it really gets bad. If I can paint the picture to somebody else, if I can tell a story to my executive team, what happens? I, I have a situation right now. Uh, where it's not a vul an I IT vulnerability, it's a different kind of, of bug that we have in the system. And, you know, I can paint a very clear picture that if somebody explores this, then, then things go bad for the business. And, and you will always have those items. You will always, in a, in a normal business, you will always have one or two of those items that are threatening your business. You either have a a technical debt that you didn't take care of from like five years ago or you you grow too fast and you can't keep up with you know, with the amount of data that you are creating or whatever the the, the situation is there's, there's a handful of, of different scenarios and you always have at least one of them so tell me a good weather scenario and tell me the bad weather scenario so that we, we get the full picture also what is most likely a probability of this happening if you can. I understand like in, if you ask engineers about probability or confidence levels, they're like they like they get they get funny faced, right? And and I understand that. I, I, I wouldn't want to like put a firm number on something either, but give me a range. Like help me out so that I can tell the story um, to the next person. If this vulnerability that you just detected has been around for five years, I'm not discounting that the vulnerability exists. Maybe it's not as critical as we think it is. You know, if you tell me that, that this has been around for forever um, and it wasn't fixed by any software upgrades that we did, um, there is a high likelihood that I will put it lower on the priority list. If it was, is one that's brand new um, and that has been in the news the last three days, I probably panic a little bit. If it's on the New York, New York, um, uh, on the New Yorker, on any of the newspapers, Washington Post front page, I'll probably freak out a little bit, right? And I will, I will have to figure out a way to get a vulnerability that made it that far out 
I need to probably address it. So tell me, if you, if you already know it's out there and people are talking about it, tell me um, that it is out there. That informs me about the perceived urgency of that fix. So is it something that, well, we know, but there's this one printer somewhere in the system that still runs on Windows 95, and it's just a printer, you know, like, you're not going to get engineering resources for that, we buy a new printer, tell me, <laughs> you know, like, you probably wouldn't even come to me with that example, but I'm just giving it as an example. Um, and then is there any information that you think is necessary for the engineering department to actually do their job? I know you will work together, um, but we need to put it in writing somehow so that they can give me an effort estimate. So what is, what is additional information that's out there that you know about? If it is a TLS update, you probably don't need to tell me anything more. They know how to do that. They have done it a bunch of times. But if it is something else, tell me. Whatever you know, tell me about it. And then, is there quick fixes? Can we turn something off while we are fixing something in the long term? Or is there a, a quick fix that we you know, can pull something out, disable a function? Is there any quick fix that you can think about to reduce the risk while we are working on the long term? And sometimes, just doing the quick fix is enough. Sometimes, if you tell me it's a specific application that we use, and I go through my data and find less than 2% of my clients actually use that feature, I might just turn it off for, for good. You know, or if it is a, a software version that is so old, only like three of my clients are on it. Right now, with my current solution, we are cloud-based. Obviously, everybody's on the same solution, but we also have an on-premise solution. If it is an old software version, I will just tell those clients they absolutely need to upgrade, otherwise they're on their own and I will not invest any, any um, engineering resources. So those are the, the, the topics that, um, that we need to cover when, when we talk about vulnerabilities. And I already mentioned how, how communicating with each other is an absolute necessity for the business. You guys are in charge of making sure our business is safe, our, our users, our, our clients are safe, our clients' data is safe. In our case, our patients that we don't see but our, our customers see are, is safe. Um, and I'm responsible for making sure our business is profitable, right? So in order for all of us to have a job, you know, we need to work together so that we can we can make sure um, our business is thriving and, and it's it's going uh, it's going well. And when I have somebody come to me and say, "Oh, there's a vulnerability. I just need it fixed right now," and then I do a little bit digging, and actually it wasn't all that urgent. You do that twice to me. After that, you lose your credibility. That's that's my concern. That. This has happened before, and, and maybe I made the wrong decision of not fixing it, it's possible, but I don't trust you anymore. So I need everybody, I need my, my product management colleagues to come to you guys and say, hey, we need to work together, and I need to, for you guys to understand a little bit better why you're getting all this pushback, so that you, you can uh, maybe create a little bit better plan as to how to talk to us. Um, if there are threats to the business, it's a threat to the business, whether that's data or a competitor or whatever it is. If we, we need to work together to, to defend against those threats. And, and I really want to reduce the number of pushbacks that you're getting. I, I want um, as many of those vulnerabilities to be fixed because they affect everybody, right? I'm a patient too, so if, if I know that a company doesn't care about IT security, I don't want my data with them. You know, we, we all are. We need, to, we need to put ourselves a little bit um, into the, those shoes. And when you develop your, your policies um, for your IT security, uh, we're a pretty big company, we, we're publicly traded, and there's often rules from corporate, since I only work for one of the divisions. And, and right now we have security objectives. They are object then numbered from one through eight. And, and we are on four right now. Right? 
Well, I need to understand what that means because number four was monitoring what's going on. Well, that's a good step. I guess one through two and three didn't cover that part, but number four did. Well, when you start monitoring stuff, you will find things. If you tell me in advance and we create a plan together, I can put some resources aside. Uh, and, and make sure that when you find something, we're not in this panic mode of, oh my God, we have to be found something, now we need to fix it. So if we have a plan together and I put, let's say 10% even on my resources to the side and make sure there are resources that are qualified to fix bugs that, or vulnerabilities that you find, then we can work together. So don't leave me out of the loop, don't leave your counterparts out of the loop and then you know, when you find something, you say, well, but we are running this project and, and we're supposed to. Well, I didn't know about it, so tell me, right? Tell me as early as you can. Things usually get worse with Agile. You know, Agile in engineering is always this like, oh, this is so great. Everything, the world is going to be a better place because of Agile, right? It's everybody's like hobby right now. At my company, we have about a third of the resources working in Agile and actually doing continuous uh, releases. We have about a third working on Agile but only releasing twice a year. And then we have a third of the team still working waterfall. So we have all of it. So we all talk different languages. What gets much worse with Agile is it is so easy to interrupt an engineering team, right? Because there's not this huge project that has a deadline that we defined 18 months ago and it's only like two more months to go and we want to do it and we're already a month behind schedule. If you now pu push in uh, you know, a vulnerability fix, well then this will push out for another month. In Agile you can just secretly like squeeze in something and you know, it's just a two week sprint, it's not that big, we can do this. You also know they meet every morning, whatever their time is. My team between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, they're all like, they're standing there like in their little scrum teams every 15 minutes and the IT security person can just walk over there and say, hey, um, AJ, <laughs> you know, I found this, can you fix this? Like, you know, let me know if you have any problems. Well, no. <laughs> We have a plan for those resources. That's a huge risk because it's so easy, right? It, it almost doesn't impact anybody. On the positive side, we're nimble, right? We can switch direction every two weeks. Uh, we theoretically can switch direction mid-sprint, but we, we really, really try not to. And the other advantage is that we can introduce fixes um, in a continuous release very, very quickly. So, the perceived urgency of having a fix uh, included and being worked on right now partially comes from the fact that it, in the past it always took weeks or months to roll anything out. Now if you have a, a solution, we can test it on Monday, well, because we have a medical device, so we test on Mondays and on Thursdays we release. We can push out faster if we need to, but typically that, that's our process. So. The temptation is always there to like, oh, let me just do this. And then you die by a million of paper cuts, right? Because you put in this one and you put in that one. And the same safeguards I'm putting on onto the IT security team to not interrupt my engineers. I have to put on the sales team, the support team, the account managers, name them all. Anybody who talks to customers directly, they all want fixes right now, done immediately. Oh, it's just, it's just a day or so of work. Well, yeah, in theory, but it usually is a sprint, right? And an entire team, not just one person. And I want to stress, even though there's a lot of us and them talk, we are all on one team, right? We're all working together for the same company, or we're having the same goal. Um, and the goal is the growth and the success of the company. It's what we're there to do. It's what we're there to paid to do. Uh, we might have different perspectives and we might talk slightly differently. Me with a German accent, you probably not. But other than that, we're all like, we're in this together. I really want us to be more partners than you know us in product management perceiving you guys in IT as being like the intruders and you're you're so whiny and you're always like have your head cut off and. 
and you know you're running around with whatever next emergency comes. I don't, and, and we're being the arrogant pricks that just always say no. I, I don't want that. I, I really want us to to come together and, and work together. I think it's really, really important for everybody. And then we always have to remember that we're just the safeguards for data that doesn't actually belong to us. In my case in particular, the data belongs to a patient. The data belongs to a particular family, their three kids. You know, like that, that's what we need to think about. Um, so it is important that you voice your concerns because we, we do have the responsibility to take good care of our clients' data. We're, we're there to take good care of our, uh, our software, whatever it is that, that we are working on. So my call to action obviously is, is pretty obvious, is talk to your product management team. Uh, they might be called something else. They might be called solutions, like in my case. Uh, they, whatever they're called, it's the, the people that mostly tell you no. Um, think about why are they saying no, what additional information could they use, or ne do they need in order to make the right decision, right? Um, and then think about it, they're just people, talk to them in normal, like, and that's not IT security people, but IT people, like I put an IT request because I can't access anybody and the answer is, well, did you try the reset password link? <laughs> well, yeah, I did, right? <laughs> Don't treat me like, like I'm, I'm some idiot. I understand that you guys know much better about whatever it is the expertise you have, but I have my expertise as well. So treat us as equals and we will treat you as equals. Um, then also, as I mentioned before, if you already have a plan for, for your security um, system, if you have a plan on how you're executing it, involve me early. And tell me early that, you know, the next three months you're running this particular project. You, need, you might need resources. And I will make, make the change to make that available. And, and that way I can, I can build in safeguards in anything that we need to be doing. I can't guarantee that there's enough resources, but because they are notoriously short, we, we all know that, but I will do my very best to make sure everybody, um, every needs that are, are coming up through vulnerability testing or whatever will be taken care of. And that's, that's what I'm summarizing here, like make product management your partner. Um, you know, work with them, um, help them, be, be as gentle as you can because we have been hurt before and I'm sure we have hurt you guys. So just, you know, remember we're all humans, work together and then together we can absolutely be successful. All right, and that was my last slide. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Do you find it useful when people include like proof of concept videos for you, like a video of the vulnerability being exploited? Yes. Anything that I can visualize and then understand helps me because again, I'm not, I'm not an IT expert. Yes, absolutely. Whatever you can find, screenshots, uh, points in the in the code, even even though I don't understand it, but the next person I give it to will understand it. Absolutely. Anything that you can do. Yes? Uh, it sounded like a lot of the cases that you highlighted were internal communication issues. Do you yes. ever deal with like third party security researchers approaching you with uh, AAE or scanning the internet and notice that it was vulnerable to this? They fortunately get filtered out by my IT security team. <laughs> so they don't reach me directly. But I, I suspect, even though they don't tell me, some of the vulnerabilities that they escalated to me are probably coming from sources like that. Yeah, the next question I was going to have is, how do you verify, I guess, what is the method that you use? Yeah, I send them back. I, I send them back to the IT security team and tell me if this is credible. And if, if you tell me it's credible, you're the expert, then I will believe you. And if I find it on Qualys, you know, um, Rapid7, one of their home pages, you know, Tenable, I'd probably take it seriously. Does that make sense? Sure. Yes. So, 
It seems like <coughs> severity is a little bit subjective based on your business case, right? Yes. As an external researcher, your uh, perspective might be different. So, um, is there a scoring system that you find is useful, or is that oversimplified? It just seems like the common vulnerability scoring. Uh, so we, you, there's no, we don't use a formal scoring system. Uh, I make it more dependent on what part of this uh, our offering is affected. If it is an internal resource or an external resource, is it patient data that's affected? Uh, those are the, 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 you know, the categories that I would put it in. So as soon as it is a vulnerability that somebody could log into somebody else's account on my web-based you know, solution, that of course has a much higher rating than something that's, as I mentioned, a printer or you know, something internally, or like an internal database that we use. But I don't, I don't unlike with, um, with clinical risks, um, there is a clear scoring there. Um, but for, for IT vulnerabilities right now, we don't have one. I, I think it would be a great idea, though. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, thank you for listening to me. Thank you again for Shellcom for having me. And uh, yes, if you have any questions, if you want to contact me, my email address is there. I don't do social media except for LinkedIn, so you can reach me through LinkedIn as well. And thank you for listening.